All right. Hallelujah. I just silenced it. And yet this, this phone has never heard Simon and Garfunkel. With the sounds of silence. Da, 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 da. All right. <laughs> Praise God. Well, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Glad to have you tonight. Hallelujah. Um, very big announcement. Big announcement. You ready? Get your calendars out. October 6th, 7th, 8th, Shekinah Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. They're coming in. Hallelujah. Pray. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're excited. Huh? It's been eight years. Yesterday, um, uh, Brittany called me and she said, Six, seventh, and eighth. Is that okay? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. We want them here. I mean, we even we even went as far as say, look, because what they do they have been doing in the past for us because we had we couldn't really afford the the, the uh, whatever it is to try to get us with somebody else, and that that church got the more services and took the brunt of the expenses, and uh, I told them I said, look. We are in a position, we don't need to share, we want to bring them in. We will pay for it. Now, if they want to do something with somebody else and it be, you know, the other way around, that's fine. We want you here. <laughs> we want you for the three days. <laughs> we, want, we want to be the ones that get, you know, hallelujah. So that's how we did it. You know, we can afford to bring you in. We don't have to, you don't have to try to work it out so it doesn't cost us anything or it's not, it, it doesn't put a lot of strain on us because we want you here. Hallelujah. All righty. Um, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to the 11th chapter of the, not 11th, the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. While you're on the way there, we are contacting at this point um, concrete contractors about pulling sidewalk. I'm going to, here's, here's three things I'm going to look at. We're definitely going to put the one from this door around to that door over there on the storage unit. I'm going to price put one here too. And then I'm going to also price going out from the pad down between the handicap spots and taking that out as a pad there. Um, not all the way over, just there. So that you you know you you your ground level on the the parking lot onto the concrete and then you go up the ramp slowly without having a lip there, so I want I want to see what that was, all those different things will cost us individually and or combined, okay? But th this is th we got to do this. We've got to have the, the the rolling ability between the storage barn and in here. Um, plus, like I said, this will double up as a. Um, Serving spot for outdoor fellowships. Put the tables on the sidewalk. Have it nice and level. Okay? All right. Um, don't know how much the contract will cost. Concrete, I know how much it will cost. Don't know how much the other stuff will cost. The people to come finish it. Because guess who's not doing it? <laughs> Can you do it? Yep. Yeah, Joe said he's not doing it. Can you do it, Pastor? Yep. Are you doing it? Nope. Uh, the, the getting down on my knees and doing that kind of stuff is not my idea of fun anymore. Uh, you know, digging it out and putting down the, you know, the backer boards and all that stuff to, you know, pour the concrete into forms. Yeah. Mm -mm. I did it in my driveway f about 15 years ago. I, did, I added a little section on. Guy wanted to hire me because I did such a good job. Mm -mm. That was a lot of work. All right. Now, you ready? Um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry are different times and in different and, and diverse uh, manners, or many ways, and, um, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things by whom he made the worlds. Hallelujah. 
Now, God in the past, and we're going to be talking over the next few weeks, um, redemption and the, with the new and the better covenant. Amen? And so God has in the past made, spoken to us by covenant, used covenant to speak, used covenant to make and establish his communication with his people. And these different covenants um, were in the Old Testament hold, hold, holding tape places or placards for the up and coming new and better covenant or the, the new covenant, the, the um, one where man was reconciled to God, not just um, kept from the wrath of God. Okay? Now, the very first covenant we have in the Bible is found in Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we'll look at what is referred to as the Adamic or, uh, you know, Adamic. Some people want to say Adamic because they want to sound like, like they're saying something they shouldn't say. Okay. But it's, I think, I actually think it is a, a, a Adamic covenant. But, you know, I'm not going to, if you want to call it the, uh, the Adamic. Okay. Okay. Genesis 3.15, and uh, God says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so here God, as, as he comes in, slays the animals, clothes them, tells Satan his outcome, etc. God forms a covenant with Adam, okay, to cover his sin so that in the future he, he can bring Christ. Amen. And here it is, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his feet. Now, number one, we had the prophecy of the of virgin birth right here. Women don't have seed. Okay? And so he, has, he, he establishes there's a coming a supernatural birth in Genesis 3.15. It will be a seed that will break your authority. Now, <clears throat> um, this, this phrase, shall bruise thy head, was an oriental term. And you got to you remember the Bible is an eastern book. It's not a western book. Okay? Written with an eastern mindset, with, with eastern cultural influences. Okay? Not, not American, not western. And so it is, a eastern, it is an eastern book. All right? And so this phrase in, in eastern thought meant... He'll break the authority of. He'll break the authority of. And so you'll bruise his heel, but he's going to break your authority. Now, isn't that something? The devil's been running around trying to take over the whole thing for some time. Got, you know, got cast out. God re reforms the earth from that, that chaos that came because of him being cast out of heaven. And that's a whole nother, a whole nother line of teaching there, okay, on the authority of the believer. Uh, praise the Lord. But, uh, and now God creates man to make him the under ruler on the planet. <clears throat> Satan comes and, and, and seduces and, and, and tempts and, and they fall prey to the temptation of Satan and fail with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life and committed high treason. Now Satan got it. I mean, he's probably thinking, I mean, he, he was saying I got it before Regine was. I got it, I got it, ooh, 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 ooh. I got it, I got it, ow. Well, the problem is, God shows up right after he got it. <laughs> and says, okay, now here's how the deal is. I got a seed coming through the woman. He's going to he bust your head, boy. He's going to take your authority. So now, and see, Satan knows everything God says happens. And so right out the gate, I got it, and now I can't even enjoy it. Because he's looking for that coming seed that's going to bust his head. And that's, have you ever had something, and as soon as you got it, you couldn't even enjoy it because something was happening that was going to mess it up? You know? Um <laughs> I remember that one time the Panthers went to the Super Bowl. I mean, I, I, th I think, I can't remember if Ricky Pruel caught the go-ahead touchdown or not. 
Cam was quarterbacking. You know, they got into the end zone. A minute and, and you know, less than two minutes left in the game. And they went up by one point or something. Boy, you're cheering, and, you know, just all excited. And then you realize Brady gets the ball. And he marches right down the field, 15, 20 yards at a pop, gets in field goal range, and they kick a field goal, his time runs out. Did not get to enjoy that, but about a minute. Just robbed you of all the whatever because of that, you know, here we go. Got taken away from me. The devil didn't even get to enjoy it. Because as soon as he gets the authority out of Adam, God says, I, I got one coming, going to bust your head. He's going to strip you of the authority you got. Because he really told him. And so Satan, from then on, is trying to run off or kill whoever he thinks might be the seed. He tries to wipe out Israel, um, you know, by, ki by killing all the, the firstborn and all this kind of stuff. I mean, he's just always trying to kill somebody to make sure the seed don't show up. God's smarter than the devil. Okay? Um, and then Genesis 15, the next major covenant we have is found in Genesis 15. And this is the Abrahamic covenant, okay? So the, the Adamic covenant is used with, uh, you know, it sacrifices and et cetera for a period of time. And they, you know, they could uh, sacrifice and cover, um, you know, the sin. But Genesis 15, and um, let's look here. Verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of, mine ho of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come out forth out of thine own bowels shall, thy, shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, now listen, you know, he has, in that culture, the oldest born of a steward in the house would be the heir if there was no natural born uh, heir. And, you know, and Abram's like, what are you going to do? I mean, I'm looking for the heir and he's not, I, we're not having any kids. And let's face it, Lord, she ain't getting no younger. I mean, he blamed it on, you know, anyway. Uh, he brought him forth and said, look now toward the heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them and to say unto them, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee up out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Hallelujah. And he said, Lord God, where shall, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said, take me an heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against the other, but the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, um, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall, they shall afflict them four hundred years. Also that nation whom they, shall, shall, <laughs> whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out of, with great substance. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And when it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord God made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kizanites, or Kizites and the Kadamites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaim, Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gershash. Ites and the Jebusites, and probably the termites. Okay. Okay. God made a promise in verse 4 of a son and in verse 7 of land. And then a covenant was made, a blood covenant. He divided the animals, drove away the birds. Abraham was shown the 
future. And then God walked the, the, the smoking furnace, and the lamp was God. Walked, in the, walked between the pieces in the blood of the animals. Hallelujah. And so God makes a covenant with Abraham. Hallelujah. He's, he's making covenant with him. Hallelujah. And uh, it was sealed in blood. Glory to God. And so we have the Abrahamic covenant. Now, this goes on, and then God reaffirms this covenant, even takes it to another level. Hallelujah. Over in Genesis 17. Hallelujah. And um, now remember, in between there and the next the chapter 17, um, Ish Mishmael gets involved in this thing. Are you here? <laughs> uh, verse 16, I mean, chapter 16, verse 1. Now, Sarah, Sarai, uh, Abraham's, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, and an, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Is that what the Lord said? No. Um, I pray thee, go in into my handmaid, that I, maybe I may attain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Men, she don't mean it. <laughs> don't mean it. Go, go into my handmaid. It's okay with me. Right. Just, if you're out there watching, that's a lie. They don't mean that. They will kill you for doing that. Okay. So anyway, Ishmael, this was about, a, about 11 years after uh, God tells him, you know, he's going to multiply him as, you know, he's going to do this um, and so forth. Okay. And so he's about 86 when that happens. Now, verse 17 yeah, he was four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael. So 86. And when Abram was 90, 90 years and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I am El Shaddai. I'm the all sufficient God. I'm the God that is more than enough. I'm the Almighty God. Okay? Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, again, we look at the uh, word perfect in, in uh, biblical terms, it does mean mature. It does not mean flawless, because there is only one flawless one, okay? And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thou be any more called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for I am a father of many nations, have I made thee. So when God makes this covenant with Abraham, he's reaffirming in 90 and 9, he's making, he's, he's making a covenant. And what does he do? He changes his name. He changes his name from Abram to Abraham, meaning a father of many nations. So every time he went somewhere, they had to call him Abraham. They were saying, Father of many nations. Now, you know the young bucks were all kind of like the, the man done gone senile. He got Alzheimer's or something. You know, 99, he, wants us to call, he ain't got no youngers, and he wants us to call him the Father of many nations. All right? And, um, and so the name changes. Uh, and when, when Sarah was, uh, her name was changed to Princess of God. Um, verse 7 and I will establish my uh, uh, covenant between me and thee and the, thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Praise God. And look down to, um, real quick, he becomes the God of Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 24, verse 12. do believe I wrote down the wrong scripture. I hate it when I write down the wrong scripture. Oh, well, I'm sure I was looking for one that said he's I'm the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. So uh, we'll have to find that another day. All right? Y'all all right with that? Yeah, okay. Hope you are because 
I don't have it on here. Just totally messed up. Okay. He's the God of Abraham. So Genesis 17, 70, he's out of Abraham. We do know that throughout the rest of the books of Moses, that Abraham, that God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That becomes who he is. Not just the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because God was going to be a, a God, uh, to the seed and the seed after him. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, and then, look at verse 10. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and every seed after thee. Every male man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And, that is, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or brought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. In other words, if they come in and here, they're going to be circumcised. They're going to be part of the covenant. Amen. Hallelujah. And he that is born in that house and he that is bought with money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh is of the foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So God's, see, this is a blood covenant. God's, make, God's serious about this, the shedding of blood. Hallelujah. To, bring, to create a covenant between God and man. And so uh, the co token of this covenant becomes Abraham shedding his blood, his seed shedding his blood, and they enter into a blood covenant. Chapter 18, verse 1, And the Lord appeared in him in the plains of memory, and he sat in a tent door in the heat of the day, and lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed down toward the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I now have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fresh, and wash your feet, and rest you yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Abram hastened into the tent of the Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Now, she got to cook bread. That's not a 15-minute process. Don't open up the loaf from sunbeam. And drag some out and go take it to them. Okay, you got you to, you know, mix it all up, get it right, knead it out, put it in there, bake it. Now y'all need some butter, <laughs> salt, salty butter, and put it on that ba bad boy. Whew. Anybody hungry yet? All right. Should have ate supper before you came. And he, he took butter and milk. And the calf which he addressed and set it before them and stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And, he, and um, so here we go. What We have a covenant meal. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> Glory to God. And um, hallelujah. And then we go on. We're going to have to get, go through all of this. So and, and they have a covenant meal share. Now, gifts are exchanged between God and Abram. In, in chapter 15, verse 18 through uh, 21, it says, in the, name, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kezites and the Kadamites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gigashites, or Gergeshites, not Gigashites. I was about to say, they had something on us before we even knew it, didn't they? Yeah. Now, it's the Gergesites and the Jebusites. Okay? And, and then chapter 17, verse 8. Hallelujah. And I will give unto thee that thy seed after thee the land where art thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an, everla an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. It does not belong to the Palestinians. Hello? <coughs> It's not their land. It's God's. And he said it belonged to his covenant children. Hallelujah. And if you don't like that, that's tough. I just tough. Get over yourself. Hello. Um, and then God promises a son. He promised him in Genesis 15, 4. And then in chapter 17, verse 16, uh, I will bless, uh, he tells us, talking about Sarah, I will bless her and give her a son also of her. Hallelujah. And yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. 
And so she gets, a, they get a son. And then verse 19, uh, and God, and God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And then verse, um, chapter 18, verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return according to, to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. And she laughed. I think it was a sarcastic laugh. Huh. I've seen my mother-in-law do that a number of times. When Mr. When her, my father-in-law was alive. He'd say something. She'd go, huh. You know, sar a sarcastic laugh. Hallelujah. And he would just laugh because he got so tickled at getting under her skin. He, he was aggravating. Okay. And uh, God calls her out on it. He said, and the, he asked Abraham, uh, wherefore does Sarah laugh, saying, shall I have a surety bear a child when I'm old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then she denied, saying, I laugh not. Yeah, you did. You're telling God that you didn't laugh. I mean, how thick-headed can you be? Y'all hear? Uh, Genesis 17, 6, we find out that um, I'll make thee exceedingly fruitful. I'll make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. So God gives him gives him a gift of fruitfulness. And then James 2, 23 and 2 Chronicles 20 and 7, refer, God it refers to Abraham as his friend. Now, again, in the Eastern terminology of, 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 of the uh, semantics and the language of that time, that meant blood covenant partner. Abraham was his blood covenant partner. Not just a, a pal, a buddy. He was a blood covenant partner. Amen? Hallelujah. And um, then Genesis 22. And see, all this leads up. This is all building. And this is why the Bible was written and had all this in it, because it, it brought not just a validity, it brings an understanding of the depth of purpose that God has and, and what he was doing and what it took to bring man into harmony with him. These co this covenant and these covenants, um, and of course, the, the, the biggest one of the old covenant and, and the most... Um, influential or important one was the Abrahamic covenant. Others were cut in order to procure that covenant's uh, continuation until we, we got to where uh, we got the new covenant. Okay? And so we had there were other covenants that were made in order for that to happen. All right? But um, Genesis 22, starting in verse 6. Now, what's happened here in Genesis, you know, um, well, we better go ahead and start in verse 1, haven't we? All right. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram, Ham, and said unto him, said, Abraham, and he said, Behold, I am here, am I? He said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. So God fulfilled his promise. Isaac was born. Okay. All right. Over that chapter, we get the birth of Isaac in chapter 21. Isaac's born. And then, of course, by now he's about 12 or 13 years old. So we're really moving along in these chapters, okay? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not like, you know, two weeks later he went and asked God, asked him to do this. He had time to grow up some. He had time to, to love his son, form a bond with his son, you know, be his, be his dad, his son, and, you know, <coughs> enjoying the fruit of God's faithful promise to him, okay? And um, he said, thou lovest to get thee into the mountain of Moriah and offer him, Therefore, a burnt offering upon one of those upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to, to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lift, Ham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. And Abraham said unto the young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Hallelujah. And we know this from the New Testament 
that Abraham had already received Isaac raised from the dead in a figure because if God said that in this shall thy seed be and he was about 13 years old and he had and there's been no posterity taken forth out of Isaac that God if he had to burn him on that altar God was gonna have to raise him from the dead it had to be that way there's no other way around it okay and um and Abraham took the wood the bur of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and took a fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? I mean, he's checking this thing out thinking, you know, you ever seen Madeline? Something's not quite right. <laughs> okay, you know, Madame, whatever her name is, that runs the uh, school. Yeah, and I don't think I don't know if it's Covell or not, but she would, you know, every time something went right with Madeline, she'd peep, pop up and go, "Something's not right." <laughs> Isaac's going, "Something ain't right here." I mean, it ain't kosher, right, guys? I mean, you know, this is, this is not kosher before kosher was in. And um, <coughs> he said, Abraham said, "My son, God." will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, prophetically. He'll provide himself a lamb. And they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son. And can you imagine? And he comes over to Isaac and starts wrapping him up in rope, and he's got to be going, this ain't looking good. You okay, Dad? <laughs> Haven't been eating any of them mushrooms, have you? you know, you're not hallucinating, are you? You know? Um, but he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abram stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here am I. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Glory to God. And Abraham called that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord will provide or see. Hallelujah. Provide. He provided at that moment the need. Glory to God. And then look at verse 16 through 18. Hallelujah. The angel speaks a second time and goes, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now, there's a lot of important things here. Um, <clears throat> one of those things of importance is this. God was in a covenant with Abraham. And as we understand covenant, everything becomes an equality, a, a property of each other. Um, the book by H. Clay Trumbull, uh, now, now I'm just going to flat out tell you, it is not bedside reading. It's, just, it's more of a scholarly book, okay, that Trumbull wrote uh, in, in tracing blood covenant rights across Africa in the study of Stanley and Livingston, okay? And, um, you know, their, their history and the things they wrote as they went across Africa um, and so forth and cut the covenant numerous times with different tribes. And what we be, and you begin to get an insight into the strength of blood covenant, even in its even in a deteriorated heathenistic practice, they could still see the strength of the covenant. Um, certain things about the covenant, 
and we'll probably cover this again later. Um, if a family member broke the covenant, they were killed. You can't break covenant. You cannot break covenant. When they make covenants with people, you know, like the witch doctor would come out and, you know, you know, we're about to enter into a covenant, but if you break the covenant, and they, and they said they, they would pronounce the most God-awful curses on, on you if you were to break the covenant. Uh, you know, Imrods will, you know, uh, affect you, the, fat, the fleas of a thousand camels will infest your armpits. I mean, you know, whatever. That's one of the ones we used to say as a kid. May the fleas of a thousand camels infest, infest your armpits. That doesn't sound good. No. All right. We thought we thought that was funny. You know, we just weren't trying to be funny as kids. Anybody ever hear that before? Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson? Okay, originally with Johnny Carson. Okay. I just remember saying it as a kid. I didn't know where it came from. Okay. Did you just look it up or you knew that? No, I didn't know. Or you knew that? Oh, okay. <laughs> what, when he was doing one of those skits with the... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Now we know, Johnny. Johnny originated that. All right. Hallelujah. Um, but God, God had made a covenant, and God promised him the sand of the seashore, the stars of the heavens, a son. And then he came, and he made a, re he made a requirement. Offer your son, your only son to me. But see, God was not doing this because he, he didn't want him killed because we know he stopped it. He had to know he would be willing to give his son. What He wanted Abraham to sow the seed so he could give the harvest. And Jesus was the harvest of that seed. Okay? Because you didn't withhold your son, your only son. Hallelujah. Okay? Because you didn't withhold him. All right? You've done the same. You withheld not thy, thy son, thine only son. I'll bless you and multiply you. And thy seed is the stars of the heaven, the sands of the, which is upon the seashore. Thy seed shall possess his gates of his enemies. In thy seed shall all nations be of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. He wasn't talking about Isaac. He's talking about what we find in Galatians chapter 3. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. Christ was the given seed by which all men would become the seed of Abraham. But it was the seed sown of obedience that brought the harvest of Christ. Hallelujah. <coughs> <coughs> Glory to God. Aren't you glad Abraham obeyed? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And so in this Abrahamic covenant, the ultimate end becomes the seed sacrifice of Isaac. And God counted it. Abraham counted them raised from the dead. And God said, because you didn't withhold him, I'm going to do this. And then Christ comes. Out of the lineage of Abraham. Out of the seed of Abraham. And God said, and, and look at Galatians. You kind of, it kind of, you kind of hate just jump past this while you're here, right? You know what I'm talking about. Notes may go somewhere else, but you just want to just run past this and leave it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I know, I know 329 is where I'm heading. I'm looking for the first part where he says, and not seed as of many, but as one which is Christ. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. 
And then he goes on and talks about, you know, along this line and hallelujah. But verse 29, and if you be Christ possessive, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here we have, going back into Genesis, God said, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to, uh, you know, bless, and it's going to be in thy seed, but not seeds, seed. And because Abraham sowed the seed of obedience and offering his son, God brought forth a harvest, Christ, to the obedience of Abraham's seed and brought forth the seed in which all men are blessed. Hallelujah. In thy seed shall all nations be blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What do you mean blessed? Well, I think it's a blessing to get redeemed. To be brought out of Satan's kingdom. Translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. I believe it's a, it's, it's, it's a blessing to no longer be under captivity to spiritual darkness. Hallelujah. And this was done because of the uh, obedience, the, the seed of obedience and the harvest being Christ. And then when you come into the kingdom, you become Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. Hallelujah. You are part of the multiplication and blessing promise that God gave to Abraham that would come through his seed. Hallelujah. And this was done through covenant. This was a covenant. It was sealed in blood. Hallelujah. Abraham had been circumcised. God had walked through the animals. Amen. God required of Abraham the greatest thing he could, the, the, the greatest thing he could offer his son. And then God took that act of obedience and gave the greatest he could offer, his son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so because of covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, glory to God, the establishing of, of the lineage that God was going to bring through took place. And now God is oath bound. Because Abraham obeyed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now, let's take this maybe a, a little bit different twi twist. The seed of righteousness for humanity was in that obedience. And mankind was able to receive and become righteous before God, which God accounted to Abraham's obedience. Okay? It was counted to him for righteousness. It was the righteousness that was in the seed of promise because of the seed of obedience. Righteousness was made available to humanity. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. And so when Christ came and became sin for us who knew no sin, <coughs> hallelujah, and paid the price for our sin, was raised from the dead, and then whosoever believed in him became Christ, possessed by Christ, we received the promise that was given in response to the seed of obedience. Hallelujah. Righteousness. Glory to God. Because ultimately in all of that, what the, what the outcome was to be, humanity made righteous. Not just money. See, we always want to, we want to spend so much time on the, on the prosperity side, we forget the, the <coughs> main vein, the main purpose, what God was after. He can make you rich, okay? But there were things that had to transpire to make you righteous. See, God could God can bless, could bless your harvest to make you make money off your harvest. But certain certain things, in order for man to be righteous, to be born again, 
to be reconciled to God took something more than just a blessing on a harvest in the natural. Financial gain. It was going to take a, an event that would break the authority of darkness off of man. Hallelujah. And that event, event was put into motion when Abraham drew back that knife to slay his son. And God said, I count that <coughs> as righteousness to humanity that's coming through the harvest of that seed, which is going to be Christ, who will procure righteousness for all humanity who will but believe. And therefore, man now has an open door and an open opportunity to come into that and eat the fruits of that harvest and be born of God, come into the kingdom of God, be declared righteous, and enter into a right relationship and standing with God because of Abraham's covenant with God and his, acts of obedience, his act of obedience. Hallelujah. And God, and we'll go back to some of the other covenants later, and God kept in force through renewed covenants or other covenants necessary to navigate fallen man, hello, or keep things refreshed until he could get the seed here. Are you here? Until the harvest of Abraham's seed could come and be sown and raised. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, if you eat Christ in your Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the next covenant comes in, uh, that, we, that we're going to talk about, not necessarily in order. We're going to talk about what we're just, we're, between Abraham and Adam is the Noah, no, Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah. Because God, I mean, they, they would get so bad, he would about to wipe the whole thing out and start over. You know, I've done it once. The flood of Noah has been, I can't say with, irrefutably, but uh, been determined that there was a major flood before Noah's, which I would propose is the flood of Genesis 1-1 and Genesis, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was void and without form. Now, you're going to get, a lot of theologians will argue about this, but the word was there in the Hebrew can be translated became. Okay? Now, let me say this. This is some speculativeness. However, to me, it makes more sense than anything anybody comes up with. Okay? Um, there are some internal evidences in the Bible that would tend to support that position. Okay? Now, when you got the seven-day creation theorist, who is absolutely seven days, a 6,000-year-old earth, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, you know, okay, I'm, I, we're not going to go to hell over it. And you're not going to go to hell if you don't agree with me. Okay? However, God says, and I believe it's in Jeremiah, I am the Lord and I form nothing, and I think he says void. That word in, in Hebrew is tohu, T-O-H-U, void and without form. In Genesis 1, where it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was void and without form, that's, he, that's tohu. Now, Jeremiah said God creates nothing that way. If he creates nothing that way, how does the second chapter of the Bible tell us he did? One of them's got to be wrong unless you take into um, consideration 
that the earth was created. There was a ruler on the earth named Lucifer, who was the anointed cherub who covered, who raised in a rebellion against God, and God cast him as profane from his presence, and he came down to the earth having great wrath, and the void earth became voiding without form. And then we get the seven days, as it were, of recreation, where God puts everything back into order. And one of the things he says there in that chapter, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You can't replenish what's never been plenished. If I go out and buy a container that holds dog food and it's never been used, you can't say replenish that you, uh, the first time. You had to say fill it up because I'm not replenishing it. It's never been, and I know this is the wrong word, but plenish, just to make the point. Now, once I've used half of it, you say replenish that, put more back in. It's been there before. I'm just putting more back in. Okay? And so there is, again, the, the theory of the gap theory. It's called the gap theory. Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 is referred to as the gap theory. There is a gap in time recording in the Bible between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 in which Satan had ruled the earth, that God he had gotten cast out of heaven with a third of the angels. The earth became void without form. God put it back in order and then created man to take over. Okay? Because we know from Genesis 1, the very first chapter, so on, you know, if Lucifer is referred to the morning star, the anointed cherub that covered the earth, who, and basically he walked on the earth, as the anointed cherub, when did he do that? Because by the time we get Adam and Eve, he's already fallen. He's, he's the serpent. I mean, he's, he's evil. When did it happen? The only explanation would have to be between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Okay? There, there's no other place for that to happen. And so, again, I mean, you can come out, Pastor, I don't believe that. Fine, I am not going to argue with that. I'm not going to follow out with you about it. Do you love Jesus? Are you born again? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the blood of Jesus? Praise God. You confess him as Lord. Okay, we're going to heaven. But in discussing these things, I, I think it, we, it, it benefits us to, to consider the feasibility of this to understand what's going on in the realm of the Spirit. Okay? Are we cool? So, so don't send me an email going, you know, you're a gap theorist. Yeah, I've never listened to you. I just... It's, I'm not making it doctrine. I'm not saying, you know, that if you don't believe that, you can't join Expedition Church. And, you know, and if you don't believe it, you're, you're an apostate and all that. I'm just saying that, in, 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 to me, it makes so much sense in explaining so much. Then you can have Cro-Magnum Man. Hello? Well, the earth is 14 billion years old. You can have as many whatever's in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 as you want. But starting in verse 2, it's 6,000. Hello? The dinosaurs could have existed in that, that phrase, phase. <coughs> A lot of things could have taken place in there. And I believe they did. Hello? Now, think about it. The commission of God to Adam when he created him was, be fruitful, multiply, re and replenish the earth, subdue. One of the things he told him to do was to subdue, have dominion. Over what? You just got done creating the perfect kingdom. What do I need dominion? What do I need to subdue? The devil. I said the devil had to be subdued. He was given authority to subdue something which would make no sense where it was if this is a perfect creation all of a sudden. Unless there's been a rebellion, knocked the earth out of kilter, flooded the whole thing, wiped out um, any pre-Adamic race there was, 
Hello? Are you here? Wipe them out. God comes back in, forms man from the dust of the ground, breathes in him the breath of life, and says, you know, creates man, tells him to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Well, we kind of got to get back over here. Hallelujah. Verse 26 of chapter 1. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And his brother Buddy Harrison used to say, thank God we got authority over creeps. <laughs> Amen. So God created man in his own image, in the image of, in, in image. Image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish and replenish and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Replenish the earth and then subdue it. Now I'm thinking if God created this thing like scratch, perfect, why you got to subdue it? You just created the under ruler and put him out there. Unless there's something out there spiritually that's left behind from the gap. And that is Satan. Because the first thing Satan does is come along and try to, you know, he throws a monkey wrench in the whole thing. Hath God said. Amen. That thou shalt not, you know, that you sh shall not eat the fruit of the tree. You know, he's told us not to uh, eat it or even touch it. And God never told her not to touch it. As a matter of fact, they were told to dress the garden. There's nowhere it says for him to her not to touch it. See, you get an argument with the devil, he'll get you confused, get you stuttering, get you saying things that ain't even right. right. Hello? Well, God knows in the day you do eat, you'll be as God's knowing both good and evil. He's holding out on you. Hello? He's holding out. He doesn't want you to be as smart as him. Now, that also tells me one thing, that the knowledge of good and evil is not good. God never wanted us to know evil. God only, only wanted us to know good. Hello? The knowledge of good and evil is not a good thing. It, 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 it brings with it a, a corruption. Okay, and so in, in the garden, we have this, this establishment of authority, um, and then Noah comes along, and God's getting ready to wipe this thing out again, but he, he finds one that he, can hand, that he can get to stay around and keep this thing going, because it was promised in Genesis 3.15 3, Genesis 3, of the seed coming through the woman. <clears throat> okay, now God, said, God puts him in the ark, saves him, brings him out. And then puts a rainbow in the sky as a promise that he'll never destroy the earth by flood again. What? He's done it before. That's right. Never, never destroy the earth again. Hallelujah. Um, that's in chapter, verse 12 of chapter 6, I believe. Verse 6. Chapter 12, verse 6. Nope. Took the rainbow of God. Oh, verses. Oh, not, well, I got chapter 6, 12, 13. Well, I can't find the rainbow. My notes say verses 12 and 6, but I'm thinking it's in a different chapter than when I. Yep. Yeah, mm hmm. I left out the chapter. I hate it when I do stuff like that. Okay? It can't be. Chapter, maybe it's 12, 13. N nine. Boy, I totally, I just totally blew that. My, I got happy fingers. 
And I do, yeah, there we go. I've left out chapter 9. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> In chapter 9, verse 11, I'll establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall any, there be any more, uh, be more a flood to destroy the earth. See, it's just happened before. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I will set a bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Now, isn't it interesting that the homosexual community has taken the rainbow as their logo because one of the things that God came to destroy was homosexuality, the perversion of homosexuality. And any preacher in any church that ain't got the gumption to stand up and say what the Word of God has to say has Ichabod written over the doors of your church. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. He is, it's, it's an abomination in his nostrils. Your filth, your perversion. And I'm not talking to the people who are bound. You should be setting them free, not welcoming them in and affirming them. And that's the truth. Got to stop affirming it and help get, get them delivered. We want to affirm. You're so full of it. What are you full of? Demons. You're a demon in the pulpit. And don't think there hadn't been demons in the pulpit before and there won't be again. And God's going to do to them the same thing he's done in the past. And he, he took out uh, um, Levi's sons. Right there at the gate to the temple, took them out, or the, 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 the doors to the tabernacle, took them out because of their perversion and sin. And he's a loving God, but he will not have the holy things tainted. And there's a judgment coming on this perversion of drag queens that are infiltrating and going after children. Jesus said, woe be unto anyone that caused these little ones to stumble. There is a judgment coming on them. When God, I'm telling you, folks, stop that mess. The judgment of God is going to come. And they will be eaten from the inside out of their own bowels in agony because of their perversion and rebellion against God. I mean, that's harsh. Repent or face the consequences. That's the absolute truth. You're hate mind. I don't shut up. I'm tired of hearing, you know, all that is is control my speech and control the church. But you're a hate monger. No, that's the devil trying to silence the church because he wants to take children down the tubes with them, wants to infiltrate their mind with filth from filthy perversion. They got a picture in the on. Fox News website today, the Fox News website, Forsyth Technical Community College. They have an early college over there. And high schoolers in their classes, they brought in drag queens, and one is lap dancing on a 14-year-old girl. The city, the community ought to be outraged. And if any teacher had done that to that child, they'd have been arrested on the spot. Any staff member had done that to that child, they'd have been arrested on that spot and charged with sexual, some type of sexual molestation. But yet some drag queen does it and everybody affirms it. God wiped out the whole earth except for Noah because of the perversion. Hello? I said, hello? Hello? And then Noah went out there and got all caught up in, in some mess, getting drunk. Hello? Abraham comes along. He wipes out, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah because of per perversion. <clears throat> They're so messed up, they want to take on the angels. Do you know what would have happened to them? I mean, they got, ended up getting killed anyway, but it, it wouldn't have been pretty. Hello? They may have just been like a, a Raiders of the Lost Ark scene. Melting in their flesh. No, I'm telling you, there needs to be voices speaking again that the God of heaven and earth will do right. And he's going to protect our children. 
And he will come in, 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 in a rage of anger and judgment against those who would destroy the innocence of children for their perverse lust and satisfaction. And I don't know how I got off on that, but it's still right. And don't you send me, I don't even care. You said, I'm going to put it in the garbage can, but I ain't going to listen to a thing you've got to say. But I speak by authority from heaven. You speak out of hell. Our children must be protected. And we got to stop playing games and being, they, you're transphobic. You're normophobic. You're heterophobic. You're family phobic. You're Christ phobic. Hello. But you're afraid of the church. I'm not afraid of you. I got God on my side. Hello. And it's so. And so God. <laughs> What's going to destroy the earth again by flood? Next time it's going to be uh, the elements melting. I guess you could say take it to another level. <laughs> and then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right. Ooh. So next week, <laughs> I had no idea. We got, we got the covenants of Abraham and Abimelech, and we got the covenants of Isaac and Abimelech, and Jacob and Laban, and Joshua and the Gibeonites, and David and Jonathan. And we'll get to those. Let's receive the offering and go home after that wonderful finish we just had. I don't know, just something grows up on the inside of me. The church is, is patty caking and talking about love, and, you know, we got somebody's got to love people. We love them, but you cannot just get, stand there and allow them to destroy children, the very innocence of children for their perversion and talk about, well, we have to walk in love. You know, it's not right for us to judge. You know, they need to be born again so they can be who they are. But who they are right now, send them to hell. <clears throat> so the real hater is the tolerant acceptor and enabler. You're the hater. You hate them enough you would send them to hell to satisfy your need to be liked and to be taken in the in crowd. Remember the Bible said, not only do those things, but take pleasure in those that do them. Romans. Not only do they do that, they take pleasure in those that do do those things. Hello? So there is coming. There is coming an outpouring of God's wrath on evil. He wants people saved, and we want to reach them with the gospel. But they reject, and they do their best to take people down with them, take children down with them, especially. Hello? Listen, when Paul was breathing out threatenings against the church, he got knocked off a horse and getting ready to be sent out of here. God doesn't do that. Yeah. Ask Paul when you get to heaven. What was that visit about? You know, on the Damascus Road, what was that all about? It was the get, get saved to go to hell visit. Those are your choices. Here you are. Make your choice right now. Because one way or the other, this thing is stopping right here. And now. What we have me to do, Lord? <laughs> now, who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What we have me to do? <laughs> okay? His answer would be anything else. We wouldn't have read about Paul. May have been a thing, a blurb in the Bible about this guy who was persecuting the church and got taken out. Somebody else got raised up. Could have been Barnabas. Barnabas could have been the Paul of the New Testament instead. We don't know because Paul said, "What well, we have me to do." <laughs> All right.
Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the tithe and the offering. We thank you the people are blessed. We thank you up up heaven's windows and empty out blessings. They don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Go ahead, Brother Joe. <coughs> Hallelujah. For the in-house offering. Thank you. I want to thank you for your, your love towards missions, towards the, the need that the meals had. You, it blessed me to be able to write that check. It did. You know, you, you know, you know, we, we listen, we, uh, we kind of get an idea, you know, from, the, from, from what happens in services, how much comes in offering about, about what's going to usually take place unless, you know, God's, there's something different happens, but I, that was a pleasant surprise. I just wasn't expecting that much. Hallelujah. It was good. Glory to God. And I'm just like, I was, I was like, I get to write this check. That's cool. I'm happy to write this check. Thrilled. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. Well, thank you all for joining us. Love you. God bless you. Until we meet again, remember these words in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Good night.